Hi, I'm Jackie Tantillo, and this is Should Have Listened to My Mother. Over the years, I've had many honest conversations with my guests about their relationship with their mother. Some are heartbreaking, others uplifting, some despicable, and some admirable. If we could go back to when we were kids and re-experience our mothers, would you do it? An opportunity to really get to know our mom from the inside out and understand what she was going through while raising the children. And yes, many mothers worked when it was not the societal norm, and I totally applaud that. But if we could see from our mother's eyes, her perspective, would we be more empathetic? I know that I'd love to go back and hang out with my mom, my young mom, <laughs> all over again as she was raising the seven kids. My guest has an extensive background with training and coaching others using compassion and empathy for conflict resolution, conflict remedy. She's written her memoir called Angels and Earthworms, and she says she is who she is because of and in spite of her mother. I'd like to welcome Lorraine Siegel to Should Have Listened to My Mother. Thank you so much, Jackie. I'm really glad to be here. We usually start the podcast off with sharing your mother's name and how how did you refer to her? How did you call for your mom or mother? My mother's name was Fran, and I called her Mommy and then Mom. As an adult, you still called her Mommy or Mom? Yes. Yes, I did. And, uh, and actually, as I got older, although not to her face, I called her Fran because it was easier to feel detached that way. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> okay. Well, you mentioned a big theme in your memoir is your mother. Your memoir, as I mentioned, Angels and Earthworms. Please tell me, I love that name. How did you come up with the title of your book? Oh, <laughs> well, it, it actually came from um, a therapy session in the 70s, many years ago. I, I had a lot of therapy to, you know, look at my childhood and deal with some of the misinformation I got. And I saw the same amazing therapist for eight years. And one time, I think it was about five years in, I had made some mistake that was very much like mistakes of thinking and behavior that I had made years before. And I said to her, but, Abby, I didn't want to keep making these mistakes. I wanted to be an angel of light. And she laughed and looked me right in the eye and said, then what would you do here on the planet with the rest of us earthworms? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll have to read and find out, won't we? How nice. <laughs> you mentioned many years of therapy. Where would you like to begin as to why you started with therapy so long ago? Well, I, um, you know, the, the subtitle of my memoir is an unexpected journey to joy, love, and miracle. And um, I was not a happy person as a young adult. I, I had a lot of shame. I hated myself. I, had, I was a horrible pathological procrastinator. Um, I didn't believe I could do anything good. Um, and uh, I didn't want to stay there. I didn't want to feel that way. And so I was willing to take a risk and um, try to work on who I was and, and came to understand how much misinformation I had about myself and the world, um, much of it from my mother, not because she was trying to harm me or that she was malicious, but she had a lot of misinformation and misunderstandings of what, you know, the best kind of mother for me would be, and she passed on that misinformation. So she inherited this from her mother, perhaps? Uh, probably. Or, or, or mother, mother and father. Yeah. Right, yeah. And so I, in therapy, I worked on um, connecting with my inner child. She was very unhappy, and now she's um, my wonderful creative partner in many endeavors and a much, much happier person. 
Um, I, I worked on connecting with the divine, whom I call the goddess, and I worked on understanding and forgiving um, my family and my parents. Do you have siblings? I have one younger sister, yes. Is your mother still with us? No. Um, she, she died about uh, 15 years ago. And are you at the point that you can, if something triggers a, an old a memory, do you know how to make it shift from the dark to the light? Um, I'm much better at it. Um, and um, I actually, as well as having a good relationship with my inner child, I have a good relationship with my inner critic who started out as my mother's voice. And her name is Gremly. And I do recognize when her voice um, comes up. Um, and I, you know, it's, I'm jumping out of order, but one of the points besides my childhood in my memoir where my mother and my relationship with her were really important was um, I was a tenured professor at a community college, which in some ways was wonderful, but it was also a horrible, toxic environment, and I was bullied and mobbed there and ended up with PTSD. And there was one moment when I was taking a walk around the campus, I was thinking about how I had to get out of there. And I heard this voice in my ear saying, you cannot leave a secure job. It doesn't matter if it kills you. You can't walk away from it. And I said to myself, whose voice is that? And immediately I knew it was my mother's voice of what she had learned being a child of the Depression. And I actually made a, a double list, what my mother would say about this and what the goddess says about this. And I had a whole long list on each side. And then I thought, okay, who am I going to listen to now? Am I going to listen to my mother or am I going to listen to the goddess? And I chose the goddess. Oh, I have the chills. There's so many people. And, you know, there's so many people that have that experience. This voice that's telling you, no, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. <laughs> and that's wonderful that you you said this just, you investigated it. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. And I, you know, I had enough experience of the goddess who I consider my my second mother, you know, the loving mother, all accepting and helpful and that, that I wanted. Um, and I knew that she was the one I wanted to listen to. And do you have a name for this goddess? I just call her the goddess. Um, yeah. I love that. So you incorporated, is it okay to say spirituality or the divine? What direction do people go in if they don't have any spiritual connection? Well, you know, my family that I grew up in was agnostic or atheist. And I believe that it's always possible to establish that connection if you choose to. That, you know, I've, I've heard, uh, I read somewhere that um, establishing a connection with the divine, the goddess, as I call her, it's just like any other relationship. You know, it takes time. You have to communicate. You have to listen. You have to talk. You have to trust. And you have to be consistent. And I actually learned um, a very simple process to channel um, the goddess um, years and years ago, where you just pose the question and then you write the answer as if you are the goddess. And I started doing that. And from almost right away, I could tell it wasn't me. It wasn't my conscious self because the language and the tone was so different from the usual way that I would write. And um, at, at this point, I get amazing direct downloads from her. And I, it, that doesn't make me a saint. I think anyone can learn to do that if they're willing and persistent. Right. They can establish that relationship or a relationship with divinity yes. or a higher being or someone who is grounded and wise? Yes. I don't think it matters what you, what you call them, what your name is. Um, I, I, I know another thing I did, I, I have something I call my goddess can. I didn't invent this, but 
it's because I can't, God is can, all that hurts. But I have a physical coffee can that I write notes in. <laughs> when there's things I don't know how to let go of or that I'm fretting about or the old messages are coming up, and I, I, get, I write notes and put them in there and give them to her. And it was something I did when I was at that horrible college I was at. I, I wrote notes for five years saying, please get me out of here. <laughs> Wow, and you just release it from yourself because you hand it over to her. You drop it in that can, and you don't have to think about it anymore. Exactly. Oh, that's exactly. brilliant. It's very powerful. And you don't have to believe. You don't have to start out believing. <laughs> you, I like you that. You do it. Try you it. Just do it, and then the evidence presents itself. Is there one particular instance that really rings true for you where— um, it was really daunting how you were treated or the, the pressure she put on you. Did it have a lasting effect? Oh, that's a great question, Jackie. Um, one issue is my mother ins- is about my writing. Um, my mother insisted on editing and correcting everything I wrote as long as I was under her roof. And the end result was that I had a terrible writer's block um, for many years. And I had to do a lot of work uh, to heal that in order to feel like I could write a memoir. You know, the voices came up, you think you are, you have anything to say, it's better to stay invisible. And um, so it it was a deeper dive learning to let go of those messages and trust the wisdom of the goddess and what I had to say as a gift to the world. Oh, those inner voices can really be demoralizing, discouraging. I'm so glad you went with the goddess. I really am glad. (laughs) So let's go back to your childhood. Where were you raised? I was raised in Southern California, a small, um, extremely conservative, very Christian town called Downey, outside of the greater L.A. area. And it was, uh, they had a John Birch Society office there that, and a bunch of churches <laughs> and, a, and a, a real estate covenant that kept out uh, people of color. So unacceptable and unfortunately still prevalent today. When you close your eyes and you're a, a little girl, where do you kind of see, sense, and feel your mom? I can still picture the house we lived in um, from when I was a few months old to 14. So that's that's probably one of the places that, uh, probably the main place, because uh, she didn't work most of my childhood, even though she would have, she was someone who should never have been home with small children. She wanted to be out practicing a, a career and working. Um, but that's where I think of her. Was it a cozy home? Did you have friends over and family nearby for big dinners and things like that? No, uh, it was a it was a very pretty little home, um, and um, but my parents, um, their families were all in Minneapolis, and um, I don't I don't know how much of it was personality and how much was. Um, because we were one of the few Jewish families there, but they were very isolated. I don't remember hardly ever having people over. And I I found out years later that my mother's family had been a very big, if it's functional Jewish family that celebrated all the holidays together, et cetera, but I never experienced any of that growing up. So you were never raised with any cousins or other family, younger kids, your age, cousins and things? No. No, none at all. I have two cousins who are five years older than me. They were one was they were both on the East Coast, or uh, um, for the most part. Um, one of them I'm close to now, but that is a relatively recent development. Oh, good for you. When you would spend time home with your mom, would you spend time together, or was she distant? Would you be in the kitchen cooking together or doing crafts? Uh, well, she never taught me to cook. <laughs> but I, rather than being distant, she was more like a, uh, emotional blackmail, micromanaging, um, always wanting me to be better or do something different. 
And she told you so in words or body language and glares and the stares? I, I guess it was more, I would say, indirect. She just said, this is the way you need to do it. Um, she, um, uh, she, one of the things I write about in the memoir is that she would pick my clothes and fuss over my hair for quite a long time before she'd let me go out the door to go to school. This is when I'm six <laughs> and seven and eight and nine. And um, the message that I got, which was, you know, her worried, because she was so worried about it, was that I was only marginally acceptable, even with a great deal of fussing. In her mind, and then she put that on you, that yeah, you were marginally yeah. acceptable. Oh, that's... A shame. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was very, it was not an easy, it was not easy. And I know that some of it was from, she experienced a great deal of anti-Semitism, not in her family because she lived in a Jewish neighborhood, but when she was a young adult trying to get work and everything. And I think some of it was wanting to make sure I passed and didn't, she never said that, but I think that must have been part of it. How long did it take you to figure out? By high school, were you kind of wondering what this was all about or why she was the way she was, or was it as you were an adult? Yeah, it, it, it took a long time, and it happened in stages. Um, I was very much involved in radical feminism in um, my 20s, and um, I... I started understanding some of the pressures and on her because of feminism, you know, that, I mean, her being told, it was when the men came back from World War II, women were supposed to stay home. You weren't supposed to work. And that was so antithetical to her true energy and joy. And I started understanding how that must have um, impacted her. And I also have done a lot of work on forgiveness. I, it's one of the things I teach in my conflict management uh, issues, and it's something I wrote about in the memoir. And uh, finding that compassion of really believing that she did the very best she knew how to do. And she did it with as much love and energy as she could manage. And it just wasn't exactly right, but it wasn't because she was trying to do something bad to me. Right. Like you said, they, she was doing the best that she could. She was doing the best that she could with what she was given from the previous exactly. generation. Exactly. And, you know, there was, this was, um, oh, I was probably in my 30s, 40s. She apologized to me one time in a, in a very kind of victim way, but she said, I'm so sorry for things you went through in your childhood. And she was feeling very bad, and I had enough recovery and healing at that time to be able to say to her mom, there were a lot of things in my childhood that weren't the way I wish they'd been, but I know you did the very best you could, and now I'm a grown-up, and it's up to me to make my life happy. It's not up to you anymore. And what was her response? Um, she just kind of nodded. She didn't say much. She was a little bit shocked. Her, uh, <laughs> I'm bad. I did it wrong, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. But, you know, I felt good that I said that to her. Good for you. Yeah, she was probably saying, oh, Mom, it's okay. You you know, it's looking for sympathy, maybe. I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm projecting something I shouldn't. But good yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, I was... I was honest and kind as, as far as I'm concerned and I meant it I knew that you know because some people do get stuck in blaming their parents for everything and while it, you know they have such a big influence and it's understandable that that we do that it really doesn't help uh, beyond a certain point it doesn't help us heal so for me, understanding that I had to change my thinking and my behavior and my ability to give and receive love, that I couldn't, uh, if, I, if I stayed in blame, I would never get what I wanted. It's so true. There are so many adults 
that have yet to move forward, and they like to lay the blame on their parents. And it's it's sad because they could have had a, a fulfilled, happy life or more fulfilled, happy life had they just realized that they can turn this whole thing around themselves. Yes, it's, it's so true. You know, I, as you know, I'm a, a conflict management professional. I do coaching and training. And one of the concepts that I found very valuable for myself and my clients is switching from blame to contribution. You know, blame is the, it's so toxic after a while. Um, but if I just say, well, okay, what have I contributed to this problem? What have they contributed to this problem? What can I change? It's very power empowering. You mentioned a few times your mom, either she didn't work or the, after the war when the moms were supposed to stay home. Did she go to college? Yes. My mother uh, had uh, a degree in English and taught English before um, she got married. And um, and then later she went back and got a master's. And, um, and when she felt like she could leave us when we were older children, and she got a master's in psychology and became a school psychologist, and she was much happier. Well, it's interesting. She became a child psych. What age psychologist did she? What age students did she have? Um, K twelve. It, it was you know she was one of these traveling. It was like traveling to the different schools and doing tests and making assessments. She didn't actually do therapy. Do you think she was better at dealing with her students than she was expressing her emotions with you? Um, I don't know. You know, what, I, I can tell you this is not about her work, but um, when she died, she was a member of a um, humanistic synagogue. They didn't believe in God, <laughs> but they had a, you know, they did sort of the ritual. And um, after she died, and the people from this community would, were calling up and saying, uh, you know, how is she? And I had to tell them she died. And, uh, and they would burst into tears, and they would talk about what a good friend she'd been to them and what a good listener and how much they were going to miss her. And my first thought was, who are they talking about? <laughs> oh, and my. Well, well, you know, the... The energy that she put into my sister and me that was so obsessive and intrusive, if she spread it out over a community of 50 people, I'm sure it was great. So I was able to understand it in that way. Wow, did she raise your sister the same as she raised you? Well, you know, you know how it is in a family, Jackie. I, I mean, I, the way I usually describe it is my sister and I experienced the same dysfunction, and we ran in opposite directions with it. She's a very, very different person from me, made very different decisions about her life and about how you deal with feelings. And, um, and also, even though we had the same parents, same house, you know, her experience, I think, was somewhat different from mine, somewhat the same and somewhat different. Yeah, it's also different when you're not the eldest, I think. The younger ones seem to get a break, <laughs> I hope. Yeah, and I've often wondered um, what it would have been like if one of us had been a boy, if the sexism that was so prevalent would have meant the boy got more attention or the boy got more resources or something. I really, but I really don't know. It was just my sister and me. Yeah. Well, I guess it doesn't matter, right? And I'm, I'm so right. proud of you and happy for you. The biggest thing is that you tackled this instead of just, you know, as an empath, it's common to just absorb everything like a sponge. So I applaud you for, for your due diligence and your research and your business is called Conflict Remedy, right? You can find it at conflictremedy.com. And you deal with empathy and sympathy and helping people all the time. Yes. So thank and you, I, Fran. I, <laughs> yes, I'm so I I feel so grateful that I escaped from toxic academia and many of the limiting beliefs of my childhood to create a a career that I love.
Lorraine Siegel is my guest. Her goal is to create a more harmonious and productive workplace. Author of Angels and Earthworms, it's her memoir. Again, her business, you can find it at conflictremedy.com. And she's a former tenured professor and now teaching at Sonoma State University. Uh, Lorraine also writes a blog through her Conflict Remedy website and was listed as one of the top conflict management experts to follow on LinkedIn. Congratulations. Uh, uh, can I add one thing that if people are interested in, my memoir will be out later this year. And if people would like to get updates and hear some of the backstory and meet my inner critic, um, the they can go to https colon backslash backslash angels dash earthworms dot a web dot Great. Lorraine Siegel, thank you for sharing your story on Should Have Listened to My Mother. Thank you so much for having me, Jackie. We'll be back next week with another episode of Should Have Listened to My Mother and a big shout out to KPPQLP. In Ventura, California, you can listen on my tuner app or at 104.1 FM. Mm-hmm.